Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon for most of us, and thank you for joining us on our second week of our Tuesday weekly webinars for the Nine Principles Virtual Chat Series. Um, happy to have you here. Um, looking forward to this session around um, keeping our teams moving through disruption. I'm going to introduce you to our host, Dr. Melissa Matarazzo. Thanks, Mandy. Thank you so much for the introduction and for getting everybody set to uh, participate this, in this session. So, as Mandy said, my name is Melissa Matarazzo. I'm in my sixth year coaching with Studer Education, the host of this webinar this afternoon. Prior to working with Studer Education and our amazing team, I had the opportunity to be a school teacher in the middle school level, an assistant principal and a school principal in New England and then to work in a uh, larger district in Charleston, South Carolina as an executive director at the most senior level. I've also consulted with school districts and charter organizations around the country. So this afternoon, uh, our intention is to answer two questions primarily that we think are probably of significance for you and your teams these days. The first is how do we help people feel connected to their work and to the folks that are members of our team during a disruptive time, and in fact, a disruptive time where we're doing a lot of our work more virtually. And secondly, in that same disruptive time period, how can we, um, how can we also take the opportunity uh, to keep focused on our goals, to keep focusing on objectives and the outcomes that matter? So we'll focus for about 20 minutes on those two questions. Uh, and some potential answers from us. And then we'll leave time, of course, for you to ask questions as Mandy has directed and offered you the, the resource and feel free to plug those in as they are coming. Many of you may have already begun uh, to answer the first poll that I really wanted to use as an opportunity to see how are we feeling and how do we think our teams are feeling in this highly disrupted time in whatever industry we work in. So this is from your perspective what percentage of your team, the folks that you supervise or support or lead, do you think feel closely connected to the organization's purpose right now on March 31st of 2020? So I'll give a moment, as many of you are navigating over uh, to use Slido, um, to vote on where you think your team is right now. And then I'll turn to Mandy, who is a great resource in helping me Get a sense of what's coming in the poll as we give you a little time to give us your feedback. We're looking pretty split right now um, across the board. We've got about 60 responses and climbing. 43% um, uh, feel that about 75% or more um, are connected to the organization's purpose, but we've got a lot of answers in the 20, anywhere from the 25 to 75% range. Hmm. That's really helpful. So feel free to weigh in if you haven't already. Um, and I'm going to continue on thinking about, so what's not surprising to me is for some of you who are feeling a high level of, of teams committed to purpose, that can sometimes be the product of a, of a crisis, of being in an environment where what matters most um, is something that we focus on. And so that's wonderful if the challenges that many of us have faced have brought people closer to their purpose. And I'll go into why that's so important. The other thing I think about, for those of you who are feeling a little less confident about that, this is exactly what we'll talk through. And even for those of us who are feeling confident now, Depending on where you are across the country and how your state and local organizations and communities have fared in this particular crisis, you may be in different stages of kind of how long we've been in disruption. And so even if we're feeling a relative positivity about connection to purpose today, if this continues and as this continues over time, you may need to return to those explicit ways of connecting people back to the organization's purpose in the weeks and months to come. And I'd like to share just a little bit on the, the slide as you see it now, um, the intention that um, the reason why connecting people to the organization's purpose matters so much. And that is because, um, uh, as you can see here, employers, employees, leaders, and members of teams consistently rank this as one of the ways in which they feel um, the greatest opportunity uh, and the greatest connection to work. It's feeling that there's a sense of purpose behind what they do. Um, but what I found most valuable, particularly for us right now about this slide and the facts and data encompassed here, 
is the third bullet. And the notion that being connected to a core purpose to, to making a difference helps people to bounce back faster from setbacks. And I don't know about you, but it seems like a lot of folks currently in a, in a stage of disruption are facing setbacks, are facing new challenges that we have never faced before. And so the opportunity to continue to build a strong foundation that allows people to be learners, even at times like this, could be really meaningful. So how do you go about it? And for some of you, maybe some of this will sound familiar and for others, it may be, it may be new and different. So one of the many ways that we can connect to purpose is often to start with a story. Storytelling is a powerful leadership tactic and one that can be very valuable in helping people connect to their purpose. Just last week, I took a, an opportunity with our team to do a connect to purpose activity where I asked a team of about 10 coaches to come to a meeting ready to share a couple of words about how they were feeling, a couple of words of the feelings they feel that um, executive leaders they're working with are feeling at the moment, and then a couple of words about how we could be helpful to those we serve. And we had a really powerful and impactful set of words that ranged from the positive to the challenged that described some genuine emotion going on for us and for the folks we work with and really also got us focused back on connecting to why do we do what we do? Why are we here and how can we be helpful to people? Now there's an example of a story of our team and our conversations that also actually feeds into this second bullet. Because I offered those prompts in advance to my teammates and asked them to be reflective in advance to think about ways in which they could um, they could use their own uh, internal self-awareness and self-reflection to make that deeper connection to purpose. Another great way to connect people to purpose is to celebrate where we've had an impact, either an anecdotal story or maybe some really big data about the impact that we've had. And I'll share with you a couple examples from some organizations that have taken place just in the past week. You'll notice that I included on this slide one of our favorite and, and longstanding metaphors from the world of psychology around the elephant and the rider. And I put this on there to remind us to remember to connect to emotions, particularly in challenging or disruptive times. We're all feeling a lot of emotions, positive and perhaps challenging. And the metaphor on the screen reminds us that while we often may be dealing in disruptive times with technical details or operational specifics, and we might be, which are really examples of directing the rider, we might also be shaping the path, trying to set up systems and structures that will help us to move forward um, in this challenging time. But what we really gotta attend to is that gigantic elephant that has uh, the representation of our emotions. Remember too that that connection to emotion and engagement with a purpose can happen in one-on-one -on -one conversations as much as it happens in group meetings. And that really some of the most complex challenges around connecting to purpose are about making sure our activities whatever we're asking folks to do over time, align back to that purpose for our work um, in, in this time. The other thing that I think is critical as we're facing disruption and potentially a lot of ambiguity as all of us have been feeling in recent days is making sure we're helping people connect to each other. So it's not just the work and the purpose, excuse me, but our very own relationships. So when we're emailing or chatting or even sending a quick text, don't forget to check in on the whole person. How are you? How is your family? What's new for you or wherever you are? When we engage in those one-on-one -on -one conversations, either via video or phone, really asking similar questions, listening, pausing, maybe a little longer than you might normally, because there might be some harder stuff that folks are willing to share given a little bit of time. And then do your best, whether it's through note-taking like I do or some other process, to make sure you're checking back on prior connections and things that you have talked about with that individual before. The other thing to think about is to remember as you're engaging with meetings to give people an opportunity to connect with each other. That can be through silly, fun warm-up activities, and many of you might be able to propose some of those in the ideas list in Slido. Making sure there's opportunity throughout a longer session for engagement. Looking and, and listening for those who are quieter and maybe calling out a little bit to say, is there something, Mandy, you'd like to share? Is there something, Janet, that, that we haven't heard from you, but, but you'd want to bring to this? 
and closing sometimes some of those meetings with, with check-ins in terms of what's our next action, what are we looking forward to, just to keep that connection going. Two great examples of connecting to purpose with a celebration of impact. One comes from Waukesha County Technical College in Wisconsin. Just this past week held a large virtual meeting of lots of leaders from across the organization and really decided to focus on what are, what are some of the amazing things we are doing to serve our students. There's their core purpose at the heart of this and to serve each other and asking for those examples so that they could celebrate impact. Similarly, at South Louisiana Community College down in Louisiana, where they have moved virtually in, in very rapid, uh, very rapid time period, they chose to focus on their values. So of collaboration or innovation, which of these have you seen in practice by a colleague? And they used Slido to actually share these awesome examples as they met virtually with, again, a large group of leaders. So hopefully that gives you some ideas, both of the benefits and then some of the ways that you might engage your team with their or core organizational purpose and with each other in the coming weeks and months. Let's turn to the work now. So again, your perception of your team, whomever that may be to you, and thinking about uh, when you think of them, what percentage of them identify, could identify a fact, the, the, the accurate organizational priorities that you all have in front of you over the next 90 days? So considering the disruption and the disruptive environment we're in, what do you think about the degree to which your team feels and knows accurately the core priorities for the next 90 days? And I'll give that a pause and, and Mandy, you can keep an eye on participation there. So it looks pretty evenly balanced between um, a, a range between right now 25 to 50% or more than 75, but our largest majority of respondents are saying about 50 to 75% of the team members in their organization mm. will be able to do that. Interesting. That makes me curious. And so I wonder if uh, as you're thinking about it, so just keep this reflection going as I head into the next section, it could be as much about that there are certain groups of folks or certain individuals in your team who maybe don't feel that connection. So great observation, and that's where you might focus your attention going forward. Or overall, regardless of the role people have, there's just ways in which potentially because of some folks focus outside of the workplace that maybe they're not feeling as connected or wouldn't be able to identify that. But when we think about staying focused during disruption, I'd just like to offer a little bit of grace and a little bit of guidance about how to start with what were our original goals or outcomes in this year or this quarter or however you may organize your goal setting. Thinking about those strategic outcomes, the time comes now to say, what does success look like in the context of this current disruption and in the short term? So there are probably some goals and objectives or strategic outcomes that will stay the same, that the current status that we're in doesn't change where you're headed and where you wanna aim. But there may be some others where you wanna make an adjustment and this is the right time to do that, to say, is there something different we should be aiming at in the short term that will feel more realistic, that will feel more connected to where people are, but would still be aligned to that overarching outcome that we've uh, intended to accomplish. And then it's with whatever those outcomes are, um, we wanna be as explicit as possible on who will do what and by when. And again, that's just helpful because in a disruptive environment, there's lots shifting and moving and being ambiguous and the more we can be clear and explicit, the more when we get people's focus attention, it'll be headed in the right direction. And we'll talk through how you can check on that execution in a moment. But I wanted to give you a few examples just across different environments that might be helpful. So many of our educational institutions, uh, folks from those organizations who may be on the webinar, probably have a goal around students' performance, whether it's achievement or progression or graduation. And those measures may or may not actually even take place this spring of 2020. So maybe you think about an aligned goal that has to do with the engagement of students in this short-term environment we're in. 
Many of you, if you are with healthcare organizations, may over time have a strategic outcome designed to reduce patient readmissions to your facility. And maybe that's not really your core focus here in March or April of 2020. Maybe there's a different action on following up with discharge patients or something that's a little smaller, but still keeps us aligned to that outcome of, of really providing excellent care. Some goals might stay the same. Increasing employee engagement um, is something that we should still be working on. It may look really different, the ways in which we can engage our employees wherever they may be, but we would still want them to have a positive work experience and wanna be focused there. And similarly, we may not be in an environment where focusing on decreasing cost is realistic while we're addressing challenges we might never have envisioned, but maybe as we're doing this new and different work, we identify some cost savings that could be useful to us when we come back. Last question, and again, turning to that mo notion of how to keep people focused. Not only am I curious about the long-term uh, priorities, but now in the short term, what percentage of your team, if asked today, would be able to say, I have specific impactful actions. I know if I take them, they're gonna make a difference to our outcome. So what percentage of your team, if we, if we saw them today, would be able to say that my, I know what I need to do in the next seven days to be most helpful to my organization. And Mandy, I'll let you watch that and let me know how our participants manage. Yeah, I'm, I'm, watch, I'm curious to see um, if they're kind of similar to what we might have anticipated. Um, we're looking at um, it's about 37% of respondents say 50 to 75% and 42 more than 75%. So leaning mm, really heavily above 50 and beyond. That's excellent. And again, I, I wonder, and I would certainly encourage many of you, if you feel like your communication in recent weeks has been ever more explicit, ever more focused on purpose and, and action, then that's probably why you can estimate those high, high responses and that sense of commitment and understanding, because you may have uh, organize your communication in an incredibly effective way because you felt like you had to in a, in a circumstance that's highly disruptive. And as we continue moving forward, as the disruption likely continues, we'll want to have you keep doing the things that got you to this point and also maybe needing to insert some additional actions like those we've discussed thus far. And this last one, which I bring to you as, uh, as a recommendation. We use and often coach a, recommendation, a recommended process called an adjustment meeting, which we borrowed from Patrick Tian, author of the book Rhythm, which I share with you here. And we took his notion of an adjustment meeting, had been refining it for the past couple of years, and the idea being to help you um, develop uh, and then track progress towards those short-term goals that you have. So without, as I mentioned from the start, you might start an adjustment meeting with a connect to purpose, quick wins, or some way of warming up the group. And then the adjustment meeting agenda is prepped in advance and people actually um, provide their responses in advance so that you can use the meeting time to focus on where the greatest adjustments are needed. So you'll see on the screen here an example of perhaps our, a team where three of us have short-term goals that we have, have defined or have been defined by the team that are really outcomes, uh, what we anticipate seeing as a result of our work. And in advance of the meeting, each of us would be responsible for completing the progress and the assistance needed with the idea that then we might together identify the next step. We'd use green for we're on track, I'm making the progress expected. We use yellow for I'm a little behind, getting a little short on, um, uh, on what I anticipated achieving, and red for whoa, we are off track and we need to make a significant adjustment. And as you'll see here, in the course of an adjustment meeting with this agenda, I might have come, myself, Melissa, with my next step. I don't need anybody's help, I just need to do something different because we're slightly off track. Whereas somebody who's significantly off track might come to the meeting looking for help. And a great colleague like Mandy might volunteer to help them in the case of technological support that they might need. So the purpose of the meeting, and then Michael, sorry, just before I conclude, Michael might not have much conversation in the adjustment meeting because things are on track and his, he doesn't necessarily need the support of the greater team, whereas the others might need some help from each other. 
So the other purpose of the adjustment meeting is if you continue to see yellows and reds and you continue to adjust and take new actions, it might be time to think about whether your goals really were ambitious and realistic for the time period that you're in. So I encourage you to think about the notion of the adjustment meeting as you move your way through this disruption. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mandy uh, and to all of you who maybe have developed some questions through the course of our conversation or maybe have uh, some coming up as we draw close uh, to our conclusion and to this opportunity to answer some great questions. Right, and uh, we already have a few questions. I'm gonna go ahead and I'll share those out um, so that we can, and you can see, right? Um, take a look at kind of what our top questions are right now in the queue. And Melissa, if you wanna um, take, those with the first um, first one, any tools that you can recommend, we will send out the adjustment mm -hmm. meeting te template with the follow up. But if you if you have any other tools that you could recommend also. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think uh, the adjustment meeting. So for this first question about tools to more easily track on a shorter term basis, I think there's two things. One is that when you start to feel overwhelmed about the tracking of those activities, it may mean you have too many of them. So as hard as that is to hear, um, that is sometimes a signal that we may be overwhelming our brains and our capacities. The other thing to think about is the hierarchy or cascade of this. So someone at a senior team level may not need to see every action taken by smaller teams within an organization, but each small team might have those very detailed actions and then it's a roll up of individual leaders of those teams rolling up and saying, we are either on track, slightly behind or significantly behind, and here's what we need from the larger group. But I do think some form of shared uh, uh, space, whether it's Google or whether it's uh, Microsoft, uh, Office 365, whatever you naturally share with your team, um, that could be very helpful. And then it's be making it a routine. I do think that can help it be less overwhelming once it has become routine or hardwired for the group. And often it can look like a spreadsheet or it can look like a Word document, it can look like some other kind of form. We've certainly seen some great tools in use. The second question is how much communication around, is it too much, is there such a thing as when people need a break? And, and I saw one of our coaches also asked it this way in terms of, um, that tension between letting people adjust, letting people deal with this disruption, and then also wanting to be connected. And I think just a couple pieces of advice if you feel like you're getting to communication overload. One thing to think about is to chunk, and rather than an individual email every day or a meeting every single day, could we chunk that into two emails a week or three meetings a week rather than five? And are there ways in which we can navigate understanding and developing a sense of priority so that even if we're only able to convene a certain number of times or to communicate via email a certain number of times in order to help people withstand what could potentially feel like over communication, I do think um, that chunking can be helpful. The other thing I think is important, and some of you may have joined us last week when we talked about rounding or checking in with folks, is you need to ask them. Um, whether that's in a one-on-one -on -one conversation or at the close of an email or some other opportunity, but say, uh, is this communication enough? Is it just right? It's kind of a Goldilocks question. Is it too much or is it too little? And then trying to understand what are the parts people are finding most helpful? Because I do think sometimes, even if we are able to get feedback that we are or are not over communicating, what if we missed the wrong kinds of communication and trying to do less or trying to do more? So asking that question of too much, too little, or just right, and then which parts have been most helpful to you? I think that would be really valuable. And especially as many of us are operating in ways, whether they be Zoom meetings or webinars or you know phone conversations that aren't the way we normally would, it would be super natural in another week or two to just ask, which of these have been really helpful? Which of these have felt like too much? What can we do differently? And I think that goes to that balance of letting people adjust and wanting to connect, which really will be as highly variable as every individual in your organization. Um, so I think, again, checking in with folks, um, it's 
probably better to go further than you think is right at the moment and then back off than it is to perhaps let people um, uh, be out on their own and then later try to reel that back in. But I appreciate the way in which your questions also show a sense of empathy for where your teams are. Two more questions down there. Um, and I think uh, I'm just going to answer the gauging how connected people are. This is a great, great question in the sense of we're all, you know, perhaps staring at video for many hours a day or many more hours than we used to. And do I really have their attention? Do they have other windows open? Or is there somebody in the background who wants to be fed? Things like that that are happening for our teams. Um, I do think that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the notion of if we have an hour meeting or we have a 45 minute or a 90 minute meeting, how am I breaking that up with opportunities where I both offer and expect participation from folks throughout the, the meeting um, and who are participating? Because I do think that allows us to get, gain a sense for any of us on who have been teachers or instructors or coaches um, even uh, athletic coaches of kids or, or grownups or whatever the case may be, you know, it, it's listening for their participation, their engagement when you have that opportunity, even on the phone or on video. And I find I have to be a little more structured about it in these settings than I did when we were all in a room and I had the opportunity to read some body language, that kind of thing. Um, so I think that might be one of the one of the gauges. The other will be, do people do the work? Um, I think the other thing that I'm I'm thinking about a lot is as folks are working more independently, what are our checkpoints like an adjustment meeting for knowing are folks able to get this work done? And to be honest, it's not out of some mistrust that they wouldn't if they could. But I do think we have a lot of employees across organizations who are facing new and different challenges in their homes. Uh, and so it may or may not be um, as doable as we thought work from home might be. And we're going to learn that over these coming weeks and months. And I think I'll answer that last question, the one that we haven't covered in, in the 30 or 45 seconds we have left, which is who determines the goals that make it to an adjustment meeting? And I think that's a little similar to how, about, how do we make sure we don't have too many? So at a it could work in that a, in a small team, you would decide among your small team, what are our critical objectives that we wanna accomplish? And those are the ones we wanna report on in an adjustment meeting. Thinking about it in sort of that Pareto principle or 80-20, where 20%, the 20% of the goals that mean 80% of our results are the ones you'd wanna to track to. And certainly, as I mentioned, that could simplify as you move up in an organization um, to, again, those at any level that are the most significant. Um, and in some cases, you might have more than you would typically, but you're looking for those ones that are in the yellow or the red that really need your team's attention. So with that, uh, I appreciate the questions and the opportunity to speak with you. Mandy, you want to go ahead and talk about what comes next? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, we um, we will um, gather any of the questions that remain unanswered, um, answer those in our follow up, uh, along with some information on our next week's webinar, some additional resources, the recording for those who um, want to share or registered and weren't able to make it or stay the whole time. And we will also share out the ideas. We've had a lot of good ideas um, shared in the ideas panel. We'll leave that open toward, toward, the, toward the end of the day. So if you have additional questions that you think of, feel free to come back to the Slido throughout the day and submit your questions and we'll make sure to gather those too. All right. And if no one else has had the chance to tell you today, thank you for leading and thank you for being uh, who you are to the people you serve and those far beyond. So we're very grateful for you learning with us today. Have a great rest of Tuesday. Thank you.